Sunday school will begin on this beautiful Sunday morning, second Sunday in September. And you can start to just get a sense that fall is not just going to show up on the calendar, but it is coming. Yes, amen. And I, I already noticed one guy who normally is clean shaven, but he is sporting, uh, there's a guy back ushering out there. He's starting to sport. And, yeah. yeah. And so that just tells me right away what's getting ready to happen. So, yeah, big time. So... For all that are able to be here this morning, we are glad for you to be here. I do know we've got people that are not feeling well. We also have people that they are gone. They had planned to be gone. So there's people that I just knew I would not see this morning. Um, But we want those that be on vacation to enjoy that opportunity. Um, Let me just go over a few prayer requests that I I had. Uh, uh, Pastor, what's the update on Steve Anderson? Still in Ireland? Still in Scotland. Or Scotland. Scotland. Where's my wife at? Okay, yes. <laughs> so the initial plan was for him to come home the 11th. Okay. So we're not sure okay. how this is going to be. Well, be continue to pray for Steve Anderson. If you ever met him, uh, him and his wife, just a phenomenal couple um, in the missions, permanent permanent missionaries, I'd like to say. Beth uh, Osmond, if, unless something's changed, is still scheduled for surgery uh, coming up. It's canceled. It's canceled, and we're probably going to talk first of the year. Okay. All right. That's, uh, all right. Roy uh, Peck, as far as I know, still scheduled for the uh, heart exam uh, the 15th. Um, so let me just, I think those are the big ones. Andy Rieger is not feeling all that well. Um, he did call me, um, and he just wanted to be safe, um, and, and not knowing for sure why he wasn't feeling good. Be praying for the Connor family. Uh, many of you that knew Jim, uh, Jim used to be a deacon here, used to be a lot of Sundays. He'd be up here where I'm at right now. Um, he, uh, graduated to heaven, uh, almost a week ago, I think a week ago tomorrow. Um, and so the services will be upcoming visitation Tuesday, funeral Wednesday. So keep the Connor family. Martha is just a sweetheart. Um, and so keep the family in your prayers. Um, any other prayer requests? Um, yes, Norma. Okay. Okay, okay. I just think that's going to be a grand old time. Yeah, yeah. Now they have Grubhub and DoorDash. You you don't even have to cook. You can just call up on the phone and have them pay the bill, though. But um, <laughs> all right. Well, we want to. That's that's even part of the Connors uh, getting together for the celebration of Jim's life. Um, so keep all that uh, in prayer as well. Brother Ward, good to see you holding down Fort back there. Would you open us in prayer this morning? Lord, we come before you in Jesus' name today. Just thank you for sunshine, Lord. And thank you for all our blessings and the opportunity and the privilege to be here this morning with our brothers and sisters in Christ. I pray you'd be with all the prayer requests that were made. Um, I just pray that you'd be with us today. Be with Brother Bob and Pastor. May everything we say and do honor and glorify Christ. Bless us and guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So, if you have your Bibles with you, I'd like you to turn to Revelation chapter 1. We are now down to the final three Sundays in this series that I entitled uh, End of Days in Chronological Order. And uh, as you might guess, uh, it would require so many more Sundays But for me, at least for me, uh, over these many number of weeks, because I believe we started on this very early in May, give or take, um, it's been a lot of fun 
to uh, be in God's word, to take a look at it from that point of what are those end days like? And as we knew, as saw in some of those lessons, as we're approaching those end days, it's, it's got a big impact on you and I. Because as, according to the Bible, there is nothing else that really needs to be on God's calendar um, except for calling us out. That's the next big deal. And um, I'm looking forward to that. At Lord, I'd pray that if the Lord would like to do it today, um, I, I'm ready for that. I hope you're ready for that. Um, to be absent, to be suddenly present, um, only to be beaten by the dead in Christ. And I'm happy to allow them to be a, a, a iota of a second ahead of me, you. you know. But <laughs> so today's lesson... Um, will actually be a two-parter um, because I thought it would be interesting to take a quick look. When we think about the end of days, we are talking about tri the tribulation. And who are some of the big players? Who are going to be, well, there's only one star, but who are some of these other characters, I guess I could call it, that are going to be playing a prominent role during that period of tribulation. And again, this topic was really more of satisfying my curiosity to know more about some of these individuals. So what I'm hoping, Brother Jeff, who's going to begin starting the very first Sunday in October to do a chapter-by-chapter -chapter review of the book of Revelation, my hope is that I'm not, first of all, still in any thunder, but secondly, it will give us an appreciation right now for some of those individuals. And again, I'm not going to do anything that will complement some of these individuals. As some are deserving of the word just a character. You've heard that used sort of sarcastic. That person quite a character. Well, we've got a couple characters uh, that are going to play a prominent role, but we've also got some great people that are going to play a prominent role. And we're going to focus on a, just a couple of them uh, today and next Sunday. And I think what I'd like to do is read um, Revelation chapter 1, just the first three verses to begin with, because in those three verses, there are some major players, some major players. So let's start reading in verse 1. The Revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. So, it would be an understatement to characterize God as a major character in the book of Revelation because he's not a major character. He is the superior character when compared to all others identified not only in the book of Revelation, but when we look at all the 66 books that comprise our Bible, God is the superior character through and through. It's his word. He ought to be, if you will, the chief superior person that always is seen in whether the Old Testament or as we are now in the New Testament. Thus, it is most important that we begin unveiling the unveiling of some of Revelation's key characters by not only recognizing but exalting the superiority of the true and living God who consists of three persons. I still don't understand that, do you? I don't understand it, but I know it and I believe it. Amen. 
And we know that for us, it comes easy to say, we're talking about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But we ought not to just take that for granted. We need to be clear about that when we're talking about who our God is, because he's a triune God. And there's a lot of people who think they know God, but they don't even understand that basic truth. That our God is something that could never be imitated anywhere else in so many ways. He is triune and we need all three persons of God. I need all three persons. I'm thankful for God the Father. It's God the Father that sent his son to be the propitiation for my sins. But And, and then through the son of we have creation, we have the word of God, but I need the Holy Spirit. I need the Holy Spirit to help teach me. So we need all three. And we see our triune God in the first three verses that we just read. Now, there might be somebody who says, I'm missing something here. Well, just hold on for a second. Because... Obviously, we see there was a sort of a chain of how this revelation was delivered. And we find here that it began with God the Father. It was God the Father who delivered to his son this revelation. And then we see that God the Son, Jesus Christ, then discloses this book of Revelation, his revelation, to his angel for the purpose of disclosing to the beloved John. And then where did it go after the beloved John? John had that duty to bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ. And I think this is also interesting. It's included in here. And John was to record all things that he saw. So that you and I can join the ranks of those who John said would be blessed in reading, hearing, and keeping the word of God as recorded in this revelation of Jesus Christ. That's why I think it's so interesting, Jeff, that you're going to do a chapter-by-chapter chapter review of the book of Revelation. And I know one of my goals, uh, again, is to actually be a little ahead of you, just because I like to anticipate, what's that teacher going to say? But... I think it would be a great opportunity for all of us, while Jeff is going to take the lead on that, to read the book of Revelation. And take the time. We don't have to be in a hurry. Take the time to consider, meditate on what you're reading and about some of these chief, if you will, actors, some of these characters, but also these wonders that we're going to see of what God is going to do to preserve, even during the tribulation, his gospel and his desire that none should perish. But hold it, you might say. Where's the Holy Spirit. I, I don't remember reading about the Holy Spirit in those first three verses. Well, he was there. He was there with John doing what he's doing right now, right here for you and me. Doing what? Well, Jesus answers this question so simply Yet the fullness of his answer is beyond still our ability to fully comprehend because in John 14, speaking of the Holy Spirit, Jesus says, ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and he shall be in you. Do not miss the part that the Holy Spirit was right there in this conversation, in this disclosure of the revelation to John, the Holy Spirit was as much part of that. In fact, helping John with that because he indwelled John as well as he indwells you 
and me. The Bible tells us the indwelling of the Holy Spirit takes place the very moment that you and I receive Christ as our Lord and Savior. Secondly, Jesus tells us in John 14, 17, that the Holy Spirit, in quote, is the spirit of truth. Who Jesus told his disciples in John 14, 26, shall teach you all things and bring you all things to your, bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I, speaking of Jesus in the first person at that particular moment, I have said unto you. Now, I wasn't there. Jesus was not talking in the first person to me, um, but I have his word. And you know, I don't take this lightly. There are things when something comes up. Maybe I'm in the word and I'm, I'm studying thinking about what's my next step and my next step after that. And God brings to my memory verses. Amen. That's the Holy Spirit. That's not my memory. I'm, I, now, the truth is, if you're not going to take the time to, to read God's word, don't expect the Holy Spirit to start telling you verses. You've got a duty to get in and know God's word first. But once you have vested yourself in knowing what does God want me to know through his word, then trust me, the Holy Spirit is going to take advantage of that and is going to talk to you about that. Not a new revelation, but the Holy Spirit is going to take what you know to be true from the word of God and it's going to emphasize it. It's going to tell you about things that maybe you didn't write, uh, quite understand. But as you read the word of God, he brings and melts together more truths that helps you to understand more clearly the completeness of God's truth for our everyday living. Now, Turn over to 1 Corinthians 2. We're going to do a number of scripture things. We will be back into Revelation. I promise you we got to be in Revelation. But go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Because Paul as well spoke about the Holy Spirit. And I would like to just read a couple verses here, and then we'll have another place we'll go to as well. But Paul speaks about the ministry of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians 2. I'm just keeping these down to a few of the verses that get right to the heart of this. But starting in verse 9, we know this verse very well. But as it is written... I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. And I just say, wow. I don't know what the future beholds for me or for you. I don't know what all is going to be involved in the moment whether through the rapture or I take my last breath and I enter into the glory of glories, I have no idea what God's got planned except this. It's beyond our imagination. And that ought to excite us about what does God have planned for you and I. It is marvelous. But let me continue reading. But God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yea... The deep things of God. For all that man knoweth the things of a man. Excuse me, let me say it again. For what a man knoweth the things of a man, say the spirit of man which is in him. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now, we have received not the spirit of the world. Although there's times we act like that's the spirit we're drawing from, unfortunately. But the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. My dear friends, it is the chief duty of the Holy Spirit to teach and guide the New Testament believer, and the New Testament church. It is the Holy Spirit that illuminates and authenticates the word of God. Even the first three verses 
we have read thus far in Revelation. So as I thought about this, I, I may be standing here sort of in this, you know, role as a, a teacher this morning, but if there's any teaching to be done that will be helpful to you, it will actually be the living word of God that we turn to that will be then enabled or more specifically taught to you spiritually by the Holy Spirit. Now, one last point on the Holy Spirit, because if you doubt the presence and work of the Holy Spirit in the revelation of Jesus Christ, which is where we're going to be, I challenge you to consider what Jesus said of the Holy Spirit in John 16. So go back to John 16. Again, just a couple verses. I'm just As I was working on this lesson, I just felt like, you know what? We're talking about the chief characters in the book of Revelation, and we'll get to one of those chief superior characters here that's really um, named out, if you will, in some additional verses in chapter 1. But you know what? I just don't want to overlook what the Holy Spirit's role is today and what the Holy Spirit's role will be during the time of tribulation because as we touched on some lessons ago, the Holy Spirit is not going anywhere. The Holy Spirit will still be here during the period of tribulation. Thank God we'll be gone. Um, and there is something to be said about what this world will be like in the absence of the church. But God will still have his way in what he is desiring, both in wrath that will come upon this earth, but also in his continuing desire to save the perishing. So John 16, verse 12, just down to verse 15. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. How be it, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine, therefore said I, that he shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you. Now this was preceding Christ's Death, burial, and resurrection. Am I right about that? Am I, am, am, I, am I missing where I'm at right now in the book of John? I hope I, I didn't mess up with that, but it doesn't make any difference. You see, Christ was preparing his disciples for the day when he would no longer do the teaching, but the Holy Spirit would do the teaching, the revelation. So, the Holy Spirit is not the chief character in the book of Revelation. Rather, the job of the Holy Spirit is to glorify in what we will do now who really is the chief character. Because if you got just what I read here, when the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. He will show you the things to come. Brother. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Very plain. Mm-hmm. Very plain. Faith the Lord. We have a Bible teacher. We have a pastor. Presents the word. And that's all that matters. Yep. And... You know, one of the signs is nothing that I plan on covering, but if we were to really get into false teachers now, one of the clearest signs you're dealing with somebody is when they do not do, let me see if I'm saying this right, they do what the Holy Spirit will not do. They tend to heap glory on themselves. And we are told that the Holy Spirit's role is to heap glory on the Son. So that's one of the clear little indicators. You start to see some pastor or some other title like bishop, apostle, and all these 
profit. Now they got profits in churches and whatnot. And, and, they, and you see that what they're doing is basically just trying to bring glory to themselves and what they're able to do and maybe they, what they did with that and that person fell over, you know, and this person in a wheelchair came up and they do leave in a wheelchair later. But, you know, but you see what I'm going with that? So now let me talk about Jesus. Back to Revelation chapter 1. Who's the chief character? Who's the most superior character? It's the author of God's word. He is the author. And we're going to talk a little bit about Jesus. John chapter 1 starting in verse 4. Yes, verse 4 and we'll read down through verse 8. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha. And Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. While the Gospels of Jesus Christ tells us about Christ's first coming, if you will, and by way of Mary and that manger and such humble beginnings followed by his earthly ministry, culminating, as we know, with his death, burial, resurrection, and don't leave out his ascension. The book of Revelation reveals the person of Jesus Christ as the exalted Son of God, beginning with his glory, his omnipotence, his eternality. Did you catch the eternality there? John bore, bare record of it, but Jesus himself there in verse 8, this is, this is what eternality looks like, which is, which was, and which is to come. No beginning, no end. That's eternality. His lordship over the church, and so much more that could be said just from these verses alone about Jesus. When you think about this revelation, come back to the very start of verse 1. What we are entering into and what Jeff will be doing, it is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God Gave him, God the Father gave him. So I would urge all of us to just start preparing for when Jeff will begin by reading and meditating on the enormity, the magnitude of what Jesus Christ revealed about himself, even in just the four verses. Let me sum up. I was going to do a PowerPoint, and then I decided I'm just leaving what we got there, and I'm just going to just highlight them because you're following along in your Bible with me. But here's just some of the things that, here's the gist of some of the things we just read. Jesus is the faithful witness. Jesus is the first begotten of the dead. Jesus is the prince or ruler of the kings of the earth. Let us never forget that in all that we will hear about in the book of Revelation, as Jeff does this narration through each chapter, God is still on the throne, even though there will be the appearance that somebody else thinks he's God. 
Jesus is him that loved us. And then when we think of even our communion service last Sunday night, we memorialize when we come together something that John bore out here. It is he who washed us from our sins in his own blood. And Jesus is he, get this, who hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. There is a day when God has a plan for you. He's got a role for you one day. And we are going, we are those servants. We are those servants that John was going to be delivering this, this book to for our benefit even in 2023 because one day we are going to be in, in glories with God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he's got a job for me. He's got a job for you, and we're going to serve him. Now, I can't see myself as being a king. Uh, I can't see myself being a priest. And, and, and yet, we stop to think about what we do. Our role even today can be a priestly role when we are doing what God had willed for us to do. Wherever God has placed us, uh, with whom he's placed us, and with what talents he's placed us, we can be serving God. Our God, the high priest, in ministering to people. Jesus is glory and dominion forever and ever. And lastly, Jesus is returning to earth as king. Now, I'm grateful, as we've alluded to before, he's, he's coming before this. He coming, but only to the clouds. And we're going to meet him there. But as we will read, especially during Jeff's time, there is a, there's a time when Jesus is coming back as king and his glory will be visible to all who rejected him. And guess what? <laughs> we're coming back with him. That's going to be, that's going to be an, an awesome time. Now, before we proceed with our lesson objective of identifying several of the major characters in Revelation, I want to again emphasize one more time one of the most important doctrinal truths revealed in the Word of God, and that is simply this. There is only one true and living God, and he is a triune God. Pastor Lane? Revelation 19.10. I don't know if you've got it down or not. I don't have it here. I'm going there right now. Okay, because this is what prophecy is all about. The testimony is the evidence of Jesus Christ. And he is the spirit, the very heart of prophecy. Get it from Ephesians 1. It's the consummation. This is my son in whom I will well please. Mm -hmm. That's what it's driving toward to return. And I got a lesson, I believe it's next week, that talks about that testimony, or at least touches on that testimony. Let me read Revelation 19, 10, Pastor Lane spoke of, and I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, See thou do it not, I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Thank you for that, Pastor Lane. Now, back to my one statement. One God, a triune God. This is the bedrock of truth that the next major character, we will find the next major character is the antithesis of that truth. Okay? So I could have went a number of ways, but the next major character <laughs> is indeed that. So when we know who our true and living God is and that he is the spirit of truth, then I can tell you the next character that we're going to talk about now is just completely the antithesis. He is anything but this. So I'm talking about who? The Antichrist. What does the revelation of Jesus Christ tell us about the Antichrist. 
Well, I want you to turn over to chapter, Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6. Because this is where he makes his first appearance on the world stage. Revelation chapter 6. I'm going to read just the first two verses and then we'll hit the pause there for a second. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and had a crown that was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Well, if somebody did not know the word of God very well and read that verse, who might they think is being referred to here? They might think we're talking about God, Jesus right here, because of the symbolism, but it's imitation. It's all imitation. His, his arrival on stage is coming with really a mask and an outfit, and he uh, was able to get that white horse and all that, but there was a purpose behind everything he did because he, he wanted to, to symbolize in every way he could, uh, I'm something, and he is something, but not anything to behold. So the first two verses introduce us to a future event when Christ Jesus, the Lamb, as we'll hear him referred to, uh, particularly when Jeff begins his narration, begins to open the first of the seven seals used to secure the authenticity. I, use, I call the seals being sort of like that, hey, this, this deed or this book, this scroll has never been tampered with since it was created. And, and so Jesus, as we will hear, or as Jeff will tell us about, it is only Jesus that can open these seals. Nobody else... In, in heaven has the power to do that. And those seals are there to basically as a part of authenticity that what about is to be open is the true and real thing. So here in uh, John, excuse me, in Revelation 5 chapter or verse 1, John describes it as a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven rolls. And so, Jeff, you'll have to tell us more about that when you get to that particular chapter number five. So we can hear from you the significance of each of those seven seals. Brother, it's going to take you more than uh, one chapter a week. It's going to be some you're going to have to just settle in, and we'll be okay with that, okay? Yeah. We'll be okay with that. I'll only say this. As again, I, I don't want to intrude where I know Jeff's going to go. God's judgment and wrath begins to be poured out upon earth, beginning with the opening of the first seal, which we just read in, in chapter 6 here, uh, and does not end until the completion of all that God has prescribed in his order of judgment and sentencing. Ever been into a courthouse? Ever been to a criminal trial? And what's the conclusion? The conclusion is maybe, is particularly if it was a non-jury trial, it is going to be the judge now passing judgment. Judgment comes first. Then what comes after that? The sentencing. That's the bad part. At least if you're the bad person, that's the part you shudder most about. What is this judge going to impose on me now? And this is what we're really seeing here. An order of judgment and sentencing including concluding with the seventh seal. And for those of you who have read the book of Revelation, you know that the opening of the seventh seal reveals seven more judgments of God that will commence as each of the seven trumpets are blown by God's angels described in chapters 8 through 11. And then guess what? You get to the seventh trumpet and it reveals seven bowls of judgment. Oh, I am so glad I'm not going to be here. For that tribulation. I'm going to be up there with the Lord. We, we are going to receive rewards. We're going to have our own judgment. 
but it's not the kind of judgment that's going to fall on this earth. And, and then we're going to have the Mary Supper of the Lamb. And I don't know what else God's got planned. I'm not going to presuppose anything else beyond that, except that when it's time for God to start imposing, God's multitasker. My wife says I'm not too good at multitasking anymore. God has no problem at multitasking. He's going to be taking good care of us up there, but he is going to start what he has already prescribed to begin down here. And I wouldn't want to be part of that. My dear friends, the day of the Lord will come. And as we have discussed in earlier lessons, we the redeemed should rejoice daily that the true and living God has already decreed that we shall be spared from the coming wrath of God um, that Jesus spoke of in Matthew 24. I'm going to, if you want to go to Matthew 24, there's a couple other verses I could throw in here. So let's just do it. I think time is on my side right now. Matthew 24. Let's just see what Jesus says beginning in verse 21. So I'll wait for you in Matthew 24, starting in verse 21. What does Jesus have to say? He's got a lot to say about what's coming. And I'm just, I'm just pulling out a little bit right here. Verse 21. For then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, not ever shall be. Just think about this. All that's happened on this world. I mean, we got to think about even the flood. Was that not <laughs> pretty horrendous? And then think of all these major wars that have happened. And think about all the great famines. Think about the earthquakes. Just you hear about the one in Morocco. And now they're saying at least 2,000 people. And apparently they don't normally have earthquakes. It's sort of a rare event. Well, it's nothing compared to what's about to come. So let me continue reading there in verse 21. Such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be, verse 22. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Now, let me read four more verses. Let's go through 26. I think we can do that. I think this is sort of an interesting thing to think of because I see all the potential for this even today. Start in verse 23. Then, if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. And when I, I think of these verses, I come back to like Jim Jones. <laughs> don't, don't go down to, where was it, South Africa, something like that, is where he took this huge group. And, and then how about David Koresh? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, I mean, f folks, when people start to, and that's why I'm opposed. I I'm just opposed for a lot of reasons, scripturally, but even in the namesake of somebody calling themselves an apostle or calling themselves a prophet, I'm just opposed to it. I just say, that's enough for me to say, I'm not going to get around that person. I'm not going to associate with that person. And I don't recommend anybody else associating with them because they're drawing themselves inch by inch closer to what is reserved for God alone, his glory. Now, let's go back to Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6. I'm sorry, am I, yes, read again Revelation chapter 6. Don't doubt my notes. Revelation chapter 6, and I want to read again, verse 1 and 2. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, and as it were, a noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. We now see the unveiling of what I like to term a wannabe, an imitation. 
who at first resembles Christ as depicted in verse 2, but in reality, he is merely demonstrating his misleading mastery, or his mastery, I really should say, his mastery to mislead others because he is the Antichrist. And interesting, and not anything you've not heard this before. We've heard great teaching and preaching here at Community Baptist Church. He does not appear as the devil. He does not appear red-skinned. Does not appear with horns and a tail coming out behind him. No, 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 no. You'll, you'll see people, I mean, Halloween starting to come. And by the way, that is not a day of remembrance at our house. We do not celebrate that. That's trash Amen. as far as I'm concerned. So I, we don't have lights on and we don't do anything because that is a day that the world is steeped in the occult, in the demonic uh, forces that do exist out there. And I just don't want to be a part of that. But when you do see the devil, even then, he's, he's not portrayed as what we got right here. He don't want to look that way. He don't want to look that way. He does not want to look that way. He wants to be accepted. And really, and, and this is not even in my notes, but Jeff will probably bring this out in some way. I mean, really, the Antichrist, when he comes on the stage, he's coming out as like the poster child of the ultimate um, geopolitical leader and probably the ultimate poster child of a military leader. He's got all the talents. He's got the ability to, to bring people together. But boy, he's strategic too. But he does not want you to think that there's some maliciousness, nefarious, you know, uh, um, reasons that he's got behind what he's going to try to broker in the coming. So, no, his appearance befits his mastery at deceiving the world into believing that he can broker and sustain unity and, a, and peace among the nations. But the Antichrist is seeking something far greater than unity and peace among the nations. He is seeking to be exalted and worshipped as God, and he will do everything within the boundaries set by God. Yes, remember that. God has set boundaries, but within those boundaries, he is going to do everything to achieve his goal of being worshipped as God. Now, we see the Antichrist depicted in chapter 11 as the beast. Now, that's a pretty good description of this rascal. That I like. The beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit to make war against the two witnesses, and he shall overcome them and kill them. And that's what we're going to start out with next Sunday. We're going to talk about those two witnesses. Really some interesting individuals with a special appointment from God to do a special service for God. And yet, in God's purpose and plans, God will allow the beast to strike them down. But ultimately, after three and a half days, for God's glory. And we'll hear more about that next Sunday. So let's see what John writes of the beast by going over to chapter 13. Chapter 13, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 8. Chapter 13, what do we know about the Antichrist who is called by his appropriate name, the beast, here starting in chapter 13? And I stood, start in verse 1, and I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, and his seat, and his great authority. And I saw one of the heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. Who's the dragon, by the way? Okay, Satan. And they worship the beast saying, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things 
and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue 42 and 40 and two months. That's about how long, folks? Three and a half years. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Let me just give a quick review of what we just, just read. Verse 1, 10 kings will give their power and authority to the Antichrist. This is really speaking of, I'm not going to elaborate, this is really speaking of a coming federation of 10 nations, and they will like the Antichrist, so much that they remove their, so their own sovereignty and they delegate that sovereignty for the Antichrist. That's the kind of guy he's going to be, that the nations believe he has all the answers, all the abilities. He's going to make peace for the world, so we are happy to give him our authority and our rule. Verse 2 tells us that Satan is the source of Antichrist's earthly rule, authority, and power. Remember this. Satan is behind the Antichrist. Verse 3 illustrates something. Uh, I'll be anxious to see what you say about this too, Jeff, because I've thought about this. Is, uh, uh, Satan's a mastery. Satan himself, not the Antichrist. Satan's mastery in deceiving others to believe that the beast, the Antichrist, was mortally wounded. That doesn't take a miracle to mortally wound somebody. But he's going to make all the appearances that he's miraculously healed from a mortal wound. It speaks up to a head. So um, I have seen headshots. When I, when I used to, when my very first, you know, introduction to death investigations, I, for one week we saw in pictures and vi uh, not videos, I don't think I saw, only videos was, uh, well, let's just say saw lots of pictures of how you die. The kinds that criminal investigators, I saw a lot of headshots. And boy, depending on the caliber used and where it hits, not pretty. This is going to be a very mortal wound. People that are alive then um, are going to see this mortal wound. But it's not hard to see anything happening, right? And now we got artificial intelligence that's going to come into play. Um, you know what? It may not even be a real mortal wound. It, it could be really that this is a masquerade that makes people see what appears to be, you know, a mortal wound, but really isn't the same as with the, with the wonder of a miracle. Um, I mean, they could do just about anything like that nowadays um, with artificial intelligence. I mean, Hollywood used to be able to use makeup to make things look real. They don't have to do that anymore. Now we got the computers aided by software and artificial intelligence to make things look real. Okay, enough on that. But this is going to be something quite interesting. But it's all meant to embolden that this Antichrist really is God. With a small g, of course. Verses 5 and 6 tells us that the Antichrist will, with great arrogance, blaspheme God. And as the proxy of Satan, you can be sure that, that Satan will endorse and praise each blasphemous word spoken by the Antichrist against God. We, here's what we read. He will blaspheme against God. He will blaspheme against God's name. And he will blaspheme against God's dwelling place in heaven. But then here, catch this. This was like a new, absurd breaking news for me. All right? I never really picked this up before. I think he's going to blaspheme against you and me. Uh -huh. It says that. It says, against them that dwell in heaven. I, that, that's where I'm going to be living. So, I... I don't know. I don't understand all that, but I'm like, hold it. 
His hatred is such that he will continue to blaspheme you and I. Okay, go at it. But I will just say this. The more we understand the likes of the Antichrist, the more we ought to be offended when somebody uses a cuss word about our God. We ought to be just downright offended by it because they are demonstrating in a small way what that Antichrist will do in such a very offensive way. And trust me, all the words that we could imagine, I believe he will cast at our God. Well, there is so much more that could be said about the coming Antichrist. But I would be remiss if I did not remind us that the spirit of the Antichrist is alive and well today as we are so warned by John. First John. Go to First John. First John chapter 4. First John chapter 4. First John chapter 4. I'm just reading two verses. First John chapter 4, starting in verse 5 and 6. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God. Do I got the right one? First John. Yeah, do I got the right one? Five and six, yeah. Okay, do I keep, do I, am I? You want verse three? Verse three? Okay. And I got to go back to my notes. Why am I having a, a thought about this? We were reminded about the Antichrist alive and well today, so we were warned by John. Okay, well, yes, I think this is. I'm, yeah, let me go back to, um, you say start with verse 1? I know exactly where I'm at with this, but I'm still questioning why I had this. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are God. And, and Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist. There we go. Thank you. Whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. Ye are of God, little children, and have and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in the, you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of air. air. Light and darkness right there. Spirit of truth the spirit of air. I'm going to close by just saying this. We serve a mighty God. And if time permitted, I'd take us back to now Revelation 5, where in heaven we see this great proclamation about who our Jesus is and what he will be in ruling over this world one day. We are very fortunate people Amen. to know the true and living God and to have received from him, as we spoke of earlier, his very body, that we might be saved from the condemnation that we richly deserve. He is the superior character of the book of Revelation. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the blessings of your word. But I'll even say, I'm so grateful that all that we will come to learn, as we did even about the Antichrist, coming a false prophet, but just even the wrath that we deserve on this earth this very day, that you saw fit to save us. And that not only that, you have prepared a home for us. We're looking forward to that. May you be honored and glorified as we gather together as your church in the coming minutes and give praise to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.